This is BBC News. I'm Geetha Goramuthi. The headlines at 10. Hong Kong's leadership backs down indefinitely after mass protests over their controversial extradition law. The council will halt its work in relation to the bill until our work in communication, explanation and listening to opinions is completed. Jeremy Corbyn questions whether the government has credible evidence that Iran was behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman. A major review of hospital food after the deaths of five patients from Listeria is announced in England. Lincolnshire flooding. People forced to leave their homes are still waiting to learn when they can return after two months' rain fell in two days. I'm here in Wainfleet, where the residents behind me are being asked to evacuate because of further risks of flooding. My name is Tony Giles, and I'm totally blind. My mission is to visit every country in the world. Backpacker Tony Giles visits the cradle of Orthodox Christianity in Africa. That's all in the Travel Show in half an hour on BBC News. Hello. Hong Kong has suspended plans to introduce a controversial new law allowing extraditions to the mainland China. The proposals had prompted the biggest protests in the territory for years. The government had previously argued that the extradition bill would plug the loopholes so that the city would not be a safe haven for criminals following a murder case in Taiwan. But critics argued it would expose people in Hong Kong to China's unfair justice system. Well, Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, said the priority now was to restore peace and order. After our repeated internal deliberations over the last two days, I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise, restart our communication with all sectors of society, do more explanation work and listen to different views of society. I want to stress that the government is adopting an open mind to heed comprehensively different views in society towards the bill. The Secretary for Security will send a letter to the Legislative Council President to withdraw the notice of resumption of a second reading debate on the bill. In other words, the Council will halt its work in relation to the bill until our work in communication, explanation and listening to opinions is completed. We have no intention to set a deadline for this work and promise to report to and consult members of the Legislative Council panel on security before we decide on the next step forward. And we'll get the latest from our correspondent, Stephen McDonnell, in Hong Kong later in the programme. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says Britain should act to ease tensions rather than fuel a military escalation in the Gulf, where two oil tankers were attacked this week. The US has released video footage it says shows an Iranian military ship removing an unexploded mine from the side of one of the tankers, proof it says that Iran was behind the bombings, which Tehran denies. Well, the UN Secretary General is now demanding an independent investigation. Our Washington correspondent Chris Butler reports. America claims this video is proof of Iran's involvement in explosions in the Gulf. US officials say pictured are members of the country's Islamic Revolutionary Guard removing an unexploded mine from a tanker. An attempt, they say, to hide evidence after several attacks that have left ships damaged close to one of the world's most important oil shipping routes. Certainly President Trump seems to have little doubt about who was responsible. Well, Iran did do it, and you know they did it because you saw the boat. I guess one of the mines didn't explode, and it's probably got essentially Iran written all over it. Tehran furiously denies that. At a summit in Kyrgyzstan, the Iranian president accused America of unwarranted aggression and of threatening stability in the region with its accusations. But the UK is one of the countries backing the US. The British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt condemned the attacks and said the UK's assessment had concluded that responsibility for the attacks almost certainly lies with Iran. 
What's adding to the heightened tensions are appearances that the US is prepared for conflict. It's moved an aircraft carrier into the Arabian Sea because of concerns about attacks by Iran and fears that there could be attempts to disrupt the supply of oil. But all sides know the cost of confrontation and there are many efforts being made internationally to avoid it. Chris Buckler, BBC News, Washington. Well, we're joined now by our correspondent, Mark Lone, at the United Arab Emirates, near to where this incident happened. Uh, Mark, can you just assess the evidence either way for us that Iran was behind this? Well, if you speak to the US side, uh, Gita, they would say that the evidence is clear that this video shows an Iranian patrol craft removing an unexploded mine, uh, that they have, uh, that, they, that Iran probably is to blame, the, the suspicion certainly pointing towards Iran for uh, attacks on four tankers here off the port of Fujairah last month, uh, that this is clear, a clear act by the hardline Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the kind of paramilitary wing in Iran that, is, uh, that, is, that answers to the Supreme Leader in order to disrupt any kind of mediation attempts between Iran and the US, or indeed to disrupt the world oil markets, um, to show that they can still do that despite the crippling sanctions being placed by Washington on the Iranian oil industry. If you speak to the other side um, in this polarized debate, Iran, uh, they say that this is complete, uh, they, they've flatly denied um, the, the, this claim. They say that this is a false flag operation, warmongering by some kind of proxy group, by some kind of actor in, in, in t intending to try to ferment tension in this region, particularly uh, the, f the fact that the attack happened on the very day that the Japanese prime minister was meeting the Iranian supreme leader. Um, and, and so uh, you really at the moment have both sides very entrenched in their positions. And the only hope of trying to get some clarity will be when uh, these tankers um, arrive here at the port. One of them is, is on its way here, the Japanese-owned tanker, to try to examine it more closely and see what clues uh, might uncover what what actually caused uh, those blasts on Thursday. And in terms of the detail of what actually happened, uh, why would the Iranians removing a mine necessarily be evidence that they might have been involved at all? Because presumably anyone uh, might have wanted to remove that mine for safety purposes. And also there's a question mark about whether there was a mine or whether there were flying devices. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, what, the, what the Americans would say is that um, if a patrol craft went into the ship to remove an unexploded mine because it, it, it didn't work effectively, um, who would do that a, 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 apart from the party that actually placed the mine in the first place? Um, and they and President Trump, as you heard in Chris's piece there from Washington, said that uh, you know, the operation has Iran written all over it. What the Iranians would say, and what they have said, is, look, it's so brazen uh, to go in as a patrol craft like that in broad daylight, knowing you're probably going to be filmed by a U.S. drone, uh, that it, it is not, it is not um, you know, Iran simply wouldn't do that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't risk that kind, of, um, uh, that kind of act. In terms of exactly what blew up or what attacked those, um, those ships, yes, there is still uh, conflicting uh, claims. Um, the Japanese company that owns the ship, they've been quoted as saying that some of the crew members on board saw a flying object or flying objects um, suggesting that it could have been a, an attack, some kind of missile that hit the ship rather than mines be, uh, attached to the hull. So, yeah, it's not clear at all. And even though the British government is now standing uh, quite f uh, firmly with the American claim, Jeremy Hunt saying there's no reason to, to not uh, believe um, the, the, the American accusation, you do have uh, some doubts from other European countries, notably Germany, saying they need more evidence before they also agree that, that uh, Iran was behind this. Mark Lowen, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's get more now on this with our political correspondent, Nick Early, because, Nick, this has also become a political row between Tory and Labour, Jeremy Hunt, uh, tweeting again uh, the British government view. Yes, well, the, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is, has a similar position to Germany, as you heard Mark outline there. He wants to see more evidence. He tweeted last night that he doesn't at this moment think there is credible evidence to say that Iran was definitely responsible for this. That's a view that's been echoed this morning by Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornberry. Let's have a listen to what she told the Today programme. These are extremely dangerous developments and we really have to pause and think about where we are going next. The idea that we're going to get enmeshed in another war is something that we really need to think about very carefully. Now, the government's view 
is very similar to the one of the United States. It thinks Iran was almost certainly responsible for this. And we have heard again this morning from the Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt on social media attacking Mr Corbyn for questioning that assessment, saying that Mr Corbyn's views were pathetic and predictable and uh, arguing that Mr Corbyn wasn't listening to British intelligence or acting in British interests. Now, there is the obvious difference between the two. Mr Corbyn has always been sceptical of some British military intelligence. Mr Hunt is, of course, standing for the Conservative leadership. I think you've got to see in that context as well. Yes, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn um, saying, yes, we the Britain should act to ease tensions and uh, the government's rhetoric will only increase the threat of war. Critics of Corbyn saying, well, look, he cast doubts over the Skripal poisoning and other incidents and actually everyone's got to be very careful. I mean, key is that, of course, the intelligence links between the UK and the US. The UK does have really strong links. It tends to get a lot of first sight, doesn't it, which actually other European nations don't necessarily get. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we know that relationship is strong. We know that there will have been conversations about what exactly the US knows about this. We know that the Foreign Office here has carried out its own assessments as well and come to that conclusion. Labour, though, just isn't convinced there is enough evidence there. It says it hasn't seen enough evidence, that it wants more to be put out there before it can uh, agree with that assessment that Iran was more than likely responsible. There is a broader point here that the two sides have different views about the uh, the strategic approach to Iran and the Labour Party is very concerned that uh, an escalation here could lead to quite a destabilising conflict in the Middle East. The government is worried about that too. Jeremy Hunt has made clear he doesn't want that to happen. But for now, they're much more likely, the government that is, to side with the United States on this. And of course, uh, Jeremy Hunt is one of the key players in the Conservative Party leadership race at the moment. Uh, more going on today with hustings for all the candidates. Yeah, I mean, the big question in the Tory leadership race is can anyone catch the former Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson miles out in front when it comes to MPs? We think he's miles out in front as well when it comes to Conservative Party members. There is the first hustings of party chairs around the country today in London. This was supposed to be the day that they tried to try to oust Theresa May. Instead of that, they're looking at who her successor will be. It'll be interesting to see whether there are any hints there about the possibility of a Boris Johnson coronation. There are some in the party who think that we, the party should just get on with it. There's no point having this leadership race. They well, say presumably now. Boris Johnson backers would like that. But yeah. would you know, people like Hunt, Gove, other front runners really accept that? Because surely the more time that a Boris Johnson campaign has to go, the more likely it is to perhaps blow up. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment of what they think. There is, There are some within the Conservative Party who think it would be undemocratic and it would mean that Boris Johnson isn't subject to the sort of scrutiny he should be in the run-up to potentially becoming Prime Minister. They point to Theresa May mm. and say, look, she didn't go around the country, she wasn't subject to real questioning and she wasn't that good under uh, scrutiny when she was in power. Mm. Only a tiny number of people actually get to question, of course, only the Tory party members. But thanks very much, Nick. We will get more from you later today. Now, a comprehensive review of hospital food in England has been announced by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. It's in response to the deaths of five patients who contracted listeria. Seven NHS trusts have been affected by the outbreak, which has been linked to pre-packed sandwiches and salads. Simon Jones reports. With nine confirmed cases of listeria in hospital patients, resulting in five deaths, the health secretary wants to know what's gone wrong. Two people lost their lives at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, one at Aintree Hospital. It's not been revealed where the other two patients died. In a statement, the health secretary said, I have been incredibly concerned by this issue and strongly believe that we need a radical new approach to the food that is served in our NHS. Here at the Department of Health, Matt Hancock was facing growing calls to act. Labour now wants him to make an urgent statement to the Commons on Monday to outline what exactly is being done. They say hospital patients and staff alike need reassurance. 43 NHS trusts had been supplied sandwiches and salads from a company called the Good Food Chain, which has been linked to the outbreak. It got its sandwich fillings from North Country Cooked Meats. It's here that a strain of listeria has been identified. Both have halted production. 
The first patient affected showed symptoms on the 25th of April. Suspect sandwiches and salads were withdrawn on the 25th of May. Public Health England first warned about the outbreak on the 7th of June. Listeria typically causes mild food poisoning, but can prove fatal if people are already seriously ill. It's probably the nastiest of all the foodborne bugs. Um, nastiest in the sense that it does have this uh, ability to target vulnerable people and unfortunately kill them, uh, you know, far more than even nasty bugs like E. coli 157. As investigations continue, Public Health England insists any risk to the public remains low. Simon Jones, BBC News. Two teenagers have been killed in London in separate attacks within minutes of each other. Police are investigating after one was stabbed in Wandsworth shortly before five o'clock yesterday afternoon and another was shot in Plumstead. Police have made arrests in connection with each death. An exam board has launched an investigation after an A-level maths paper sat by students yesterday was leaked online. Pearson said it was determined to identify the source of the breach. Edexcel A-level maths papers were also leaked in 2017 and 2018. The headlines on BBC News. Hong Kong's leadership backs down indefinitely after mass protests over their controversial extradition law. Jeremy Corbyn questions whether the government has credible evidence that Iran was behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. A major review of hospital food after the deaths of five patients from Listeria is announced in England. Sport and a full roundup from the BBC Sports Centre. Mike Bushell, good morning. Hi there, Gita. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, England have quite often uh, keep up to date with what's happening there and see in-play highlights on bbc.co.uk forward slash sport. But that's all for now. Back to you, Gita. Mike, thanks very much. Flood warnings remain in place across Britain, with river levels still dangerously high after last week's heavy rainfall. Hundreds of people have been evacuated from their homes in Lincolnshire, where they've declared a state of emergency. RAF helicopters were called in with 100 tonnes of sandbanks to block a river bank breach after the equivalent of two months' rain fell in just two days. Well, joining me now from Wayne Fleet is our reporter, Michael Cowan. Michael, how bad is this at the moment? Things were looking up before. Uh, last night they managed to plug that breach using 270 tonnes of sandbags uh, using RAF Chinook helicopters. Um, residents came out on the streets behind me. You can see they're quite badly flooded. Um, and said it's receding. This is good news. But in the last half hour, we've seen a fresh, uh, we, we've seen a fresh presence from police here, uh, going around telling residents that they do need to evacuate. Um, further to that, we're being told of a further uh, possible breach. Um, along the same stretch of river that they repaired last night. So this is a moving situation and it's very, very difficult. You know, already 170 homes have been evacuated. A hundred of those have been confirmed as flooded. And for this small, tight-knit community, it's a really difficult time because just when they think things are looking up, there's another fresh bout of worry. And did people feel that they had enough warning or did it all just happen far too quickly? Look, I mean, it did happen very quickly, but their residents seem to be very, very happy with the way the emergency services have acted. They've acted very swiftly. The Environment Agency uh, worked uh, collaboratively, bleh, collaboratively with the RAF from the beginning working on that. There is a heavy police presence. There are fire trucks trying to pump water out of houses all around the area. Um, so there is no suggestion here that the authorities have been anything less than exemplary. Um, and they are, as we speak, going door to door, asking residents to evacuate. Similarly, uh, about 20 minutes ago, we saw those rescue boats, those red rescue boats, going out on what should be road, but is now river, going round houses to see if there's anyone left who needs to be evacuated, who can't get out of their house. Because further down the road behind me, which you can't quite see, the water is waist height. And whilst most of those houses are thought to have been evacuated, um, they were just going to double check. So this is a changing situation. It's a moving situation and a very distressing one for this tight knit local community. OK, Michael Cohen, thank you. The World Health Organization says it is deeply concerned about the ongoing outbreak of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is already the second worst in history. 
The international health body is working with neighbouring countries to prepare for any possible spread of disease, but the response on the ground remains overstretched and underfunded. The comedian Joe Brand has been told she won't face police action for a joke she made about throwing battery acid over politicians. She's acknowledged the comments were ill-judged. The BBC said the remarks on the Radio 4 show Hearsay uh, were never intended to condone violence. The comedian David Baddiel has criticised the BBC for excluding the joke from repeat broadcasts. Faster trains between South Wales and London could arrive next year if a new train operator can overcome opposition to its plan. A new train operator called Grand Union has applied to run hourly services between Cardiff and London, accelerating the current journey time by up to 20 minutes. But the Department for Transport has raised objections to the plan. Well, Simon Calder, our travel correspondent, is uh, at the Independent. Of course, he's there for us in Paddington. Uh, Simon, what's the plan, first of all, for faster trains and, and why would anyone object? Well, uh, Grand Union wants to have what's called open access services from here at Paddington running every hour, taking just one hour, 45 minutes. And they would do that by cutting out all the stops between here and Bristol Parkway, which is just north of the city of Bristol. They'd add a stop at Seven Tunnel Junction, then continue to Newport and Cardiff. One hour, 45 minutes, they claim. And um, they would uh, say, it's going to be terrific. We need competition against GWR, which has been having the uh, franchise from here to South Wales and also to uh, Bristol, Devon, Cornwall uh, for the past 23 years without any competition on those long haul journeys. What and, is the uh, In terms of what? Yeah, sorry, what is the government saying about that? Well, the Department for Transport has responded to this application by uh, Grand Union, which has basically put in the request to the Office of Rail and Road, saying, well, hang on a minute. Um, there is going to be what they call abstraction, taking cash away from GWR. And when um, the Department for Transport awards these trade franchises, it's done on the basis of what they think the train operator will earn. So that's a problem. And the uh, Grand Union say we're going to be cutting ticket prices, 80 percent of the uh, normal um, walk up fares. Um, so they'll be cheaper than GWR. And they also say they're going to have a range of advanced tickets. Um, but on top of that, the Department of Transport and other people are saying, well, no, we don't really like the idea of having extra trains. It will add to congestion. That will cause more delays. And as a result of that, we are going to see a lot of problems involving um, trains being delayed. Um, so it remains to be seen what's going to happen. But of course, very exciting news for people in South Wales. The electrification has been finished, um, thank goodness, and uh, it's not going to be going all the way to Swansea, which was the original idea, but um, people are hoping they will get a better service. However, everything is up in the air. The Department for Transport is conducting a rail review, and it may be that by December 2020, a year and a half from now, when they want to start these services, they simply haven't got the... Uh, uh, they've changed the whole system, and open access is no longer a possibility. Simon Corder, good to see you there in Paddington Forest. Thanks very much. Let's have a look at the weather now with Thomas. Hello. Well, we can't guarantee dry weather anywhere today. Yes, there's been a lot of fine weather around so far today, particularly across central and eastern parts of the UK. But showers are gathering and it's already been raining across some western parts of the UK. This is where the showers are around the middle of the afternoon across parts of the south, the Midlands, certainly the northwest of England and some across western parts of Scotland as well and cool temperatures between 15 and 19 degrees. Now the weather isn't going to change overall across the UK, at least the pattern into uh, Sunday. Uh, we still have low pressure sitting pretty much in the same place. It keeps dragging in clouds and some showers. Uh, morning temperatures on Sunday will be more or less what we had earlier on today. And then tomorrow, again, a mixture of sunshine and showers. The breeze will be very noticeable, particularly around western and southern coasts on Sunday. So it might feel a little on the nippy side with highs maybe squeezing out 20 degrees.